So hello everyone, welcome to Full Sail University. My name is Ron Cook, I'm the Program Director for the Entertainment Business and the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Master of Science degree programs here at Full Sail. Today's topic obviously is crowdfunding, and I'd like for you to please join me in welcoming our guest panelists today, John Nash and Mark Moeller. Thanks very much to both of you gentlemen for taking time out of your schedule today. One of the things I thought we could uh, start to do as we take our seats here is to kind of give you a little bit of background on us so that you know who's going to be speaking to you today. First, as I already mentioned, I'm the program director for two of the master's degree programs here, the entertainment business and innovation and entrepreneurship. But my financial background, I came out of the private equity uh, industry coming to full sale and taught finance for five years. John, as you could see, whoops, sorry. John, as you could see, like me, has been involved as an educator here at Full Sail, and he teaches in the Entertainment Business Bachelor of Science degree program. And like me, he's been involved in several crowdfunding projects in terms of funding the projects. He's also a musician like me. Mark Moeller is an attorney and a social entrepreneur, but he's also the CEO of his own crowdfunding website, Sprigster, and I'll let him talk more about that in a second. Uh, Mark tells me he's the only non-musician on the panel up here, but I bet if you coax him near the end, he might burst into song. So maybe you could help him with that at the end. So that's a little bit about us. What we want to cover today, rather than doing the traditional, the moderator ask panelist questions and they respond, we thought, if you're okay with it, we do sort of a free-form dialogue and we'd walk through a very brief agenda to start with basically what is crowdfunding and how does it work to look at what makes a project successful and then more importantly at the end to talk about where it's headed because there's some very exciting things on the horizon which the three of us believe are going to really fundamentally change the way projects and companies are financed in the future. At the end of course we'll have plenty of room for and time for questions and answers and as you know, in typical full sale style, if you want to address a question to any of the panelists, it's just Ron and John and Mark at the end. We'll be able to answer, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Does that sound like a reasonable agenda to everyone for the day? Cool. What I'd like to do before we go any further is to tell you about why we think this session is important and while the, while the, why the whole topic of crowdfunding is very important for us to understand. And let me drop back for a second and tell you how we used to do it old school. If we were gonna finance a traditional company years ago, we might start by obviously determining the amount of money we need to raise. And then typically, if we were doing manufacturing or retail or something of that nature, we would simply walk down to our neighborhood bank and talk to our neighborhood banker. Hi John, neighborhood banker. And we would say, I need to borrow $10,000. And provided I met the bank's three main criteria, I'd be able to walk out with a bank loan. Those three criteria tend to be, and this is an overgeneralization, would tend to be, do I have good credit? Do I have collateral in the forms of things the bank can see as security, buildings and fleets of vehicles and equipment and things of that nature? And then finally, do I have an established track record that demonstrates that I know what the heck I'm doing in my business? Can I demonstrate that I have a qualified team? Do we have a track record of profitable success? And that will probably yield at least some of the money we might need to form our company. So why are we talking about crowdfunding today? I think the answer is obvious. The graduates from any college or university these days if you wanted to start a venture or project, and we wanted to try to apply that old school model, it's simply not going to work. And this is with no offense to anybody attending or watching later. Because when you walk into the bank, maybe you don't have great credit, maybe you don't have a lot of collateral, and maybe you don't have an established track record in your industry yet. So as the old joke goes, about the time that you can convince a bank you don't need any money, and you have all those things, that's when they want to start to give you some. But you don't need the money then, you need the money now. 
So the way most companies, it has been my experience, are financed these days, tend to be a combination of things, but it tends to start off with the very, very basic, what we refer to in the industry as bootstrapping. And simply stating bootstrapping is cobbling together what little amount of funds we can and tapping our friends and family, selling everything we possibly can on eBay, seriously, and raising as much money as we possibly can. Because think about the logic of going to ask a, pers a perfect stranger in the form of an angel investor or venture capitalist at a higher level. How could we go ask them for money if we haven't been able to come up with at least some on our own? Because investors don't want to hear that. They want to know that you have money at risk as well. And think about if that didn't happen. Think about if you went to an angel investor looking for $100,000, just to use that as an example, and they said, how much money have you come up with? And you said, you know, I tapped my friends, my family, the people that know me the best, love me the most, clearly know what my capabilities are, and they wouldn't give me a darn cent. Well, then why would a perfect stranger bet on you if the people closest to you wouldn't bet on you? So now we ramp ahead to the topic of today, crowdfunding. The interesting thing to me is crowdfunding, if you want to look at it this way, it's almost like just having an extended family, a, a bigger group of friends through social networking that now we can tap beyond our own direct family uh, and go to those people that know us informally, socially, and maybe if they also believe in us and we can demonstrate that people believe in us, maybe even a, an occasional perfect stranger will also jump on board because they believe in whatever we're trying to do. So that's really what leads us into crowdfunding. We wanted to start with a simple definition. And the definition is basically this, that we're gonna raise um, a lot of individual small amounts that's going to amount to a, a greater amount. And we're gonna do that predominantly through using social networking and the internet. Isn't it awesome that ever since Al Gore invented the internet, we found all these new uses? For it. And the one today, which is we're going to talk about the, the pluses and minuses of using it as a financing vehicle, but it's amazing the reach that we can achieve instantly in terms of reaching that greater circle of friends. The way that it works basically is this, and the panel and I discussed, you know, the easy way for us to think about it is to think about some really big examples of people with lots of friends. So let's take a couple of quick examples. Let's take Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, and to simply tell you this, what if right now today, while we're talking, what if Justin Bieber tweeted out, hey everybody, hey fans, you know, I'm really thinking about doing some kind of new project, could you send me a buck, one dollar? If Justin did that today, then he'd have 34 million bucks if everybody participated, 34 million dollars. And let's say he wanted to do a, a new album and he promised all the people that pledged money that if they gave him 20 bucks, then he would send them a download of that new album before anybody else could get it. And let's say only half of the people that he sent that to decided to participate. That would represent $340 million. $340 million. About $240 million for Taylor and about the same as Justin for Lady Gaga as an example. So right there, if that could happen, just think about the power of being able to contact and have those people fund a creative project. Obviously, it doesn't work that way for those superstars, and they have labels supporting them and things that most of us don't. But that is the way that it works. The power of the crowd, a very small amount of money, multiplied many thousands or possibly millions of times, and that's how these projects are funded. Excuse me, let's look at uh, what crowdfunding is not. The first thing that crowdfunding is not, just to clarify, is it's not a loan. This is not something that's going to be paid back. Many of you are well aware and may have actually attended some of the sessions uh, here at Full Sail with people from what are called micro-lending sites. And a micro-lending site is something that would loan a very small amount of money to individuals, typically in third world countries, where we're not giving them a handout, we're giving them a hand up. And we're gonna pledge 20, 50 bucks, and we're gonna get that money back. And we're gonna keep doing it, and those things are wonderful. A good example of that, we've had the founder here on campus, is called Kiva. 
That's a micro lending site. Crowdfunding is not micro lending. People are making a pledge, in essence, a contribution to the project and to the cause. The second thing that crowdfunding is not, and we're going to speak to this more later, is it's not an investment. So in the example I gave of Justin Bieber or Lady Gaga or Taylor Swift, if their album went on to achieve billions of dollars in sales, the people that pledged that 20 bucks, they're not going to benefit from that. All they got was the download of the album. So they're not going to participate as owners. And this is highly regulated, and again, we'll touch more on that later. And the final thing that it's not, and I just want to clarify this, and we'll share some statistics with you, it's definitely not a guaranteed success. So thinking that automatically we can go to any of these uh, portals that we're going to discuss in just a second and have automatic success for our project or venture, that's simply not the way that it works. So let's look at some of the players, and obviously many of you are familiar with this. We have Kickstarter, we have Indiegogo, Rocket Hub, many other ones. Sometimes they argue about who's the largest. Indiegogo got started in 2008 and basically got started originally as a vehicle to fund independent films. And within just a year or two, it morphed into funding anything. So it started off independent films, now handles just about anything. They claim they're the largest. Kickstarter also claims they're the largest. They started in 2009 and they fund just about anything. And then finally, and you may be familiar with this one because the CEO, Brian Meese, has been on campus and talked to students many times, is Rocket Hub. It's a new up-and-coming site that's only been around a couple of years and has already funded about half a billion dollars, I believe, worth of uh, projects and ventures. So again, just to take a quick look, they're all similar in some respects, different in others. This isn't a session about that. We'll let you take a look at those. But Indiegogo, again, usually listing a project on its uh, homepage, maybe rotating in terms of projects that are seeing some level of success. Kickstarter, if you look down at the bottom here, for those of you that can see it, here's a project that apparently was looking for about $3,000 and has so far raised 151% of its goal, up to about 4,500 bucks. Uh, finally, Rocket Hub, and this one, it, this one has become my favorite, not just because I've had the pleasure of becoming friends with the CEO, they do something a little bit different. What they do is if they really like your project and think it's creative and newsworthy, they send out press releases about you. So the press release goes out to major media and they've had hundreds and hundreds of articles written about them, but not about Rocket Hub, about you and your project. And of course at the bottom, oh by the way, this is being funded on something called Rocket Hub. So a pretty creative approach to getting the word out that obviously is gonna help you get funded. Finally, just a couple of uh, statistics and then we'll move on to the rest of the discussion. The first one might be somewhat of a disappointment to you and that's the fact that according to the folks at Kickstarter, which had the most statistics available for us, only about 43% of all the projects get funded. So less than half of projects are successfully funded. Of those that are successfully funded, the majority, two-thirds, are less than $10,000. They're between $1,000 and $10,000. Most of the sites, including Rocket Hub and Kickstarter, will tell you that their average raise is around $3,500, so something around three or $4,000. Two-thirds, though, less than $10,000. Here's the really bad news. Of projects that were put up for potential funding, if they weren't funded, of those that were not, 62% didn't even get to the 20% level. So let me do that math for you. They wanted to raise $10,000. After contacting all their followers and supporters and friends, they couldn't even get to two grand. And in most cases, they don't get that money because the project was not successfully funded. And the last statistic, just so that you'll know, each of them are a little bit different. But basically, they charge a fee, and there are typically two components to the fee. There's a fee that's a commission, whatever percentage of the total dollars raised. That's the first fee, and that varies from site to site. And the second fee is a credit card processing fee to use PayPal or other credit cards. And so the total amount of the fees tends to range in the 8 to 12% range. Okay, so with that sort of as a, as a you know, prelude to what we're going to talk about, what I'd like to ask John now to come in and talk to you about are a couple of things. One would be to look at the motivation of people like us, those of us out in the crowd, 
what would mo motivate us and make us interested in actually contributing to a project? Again, not an investment, a contribution to a project. To look at some of the elements that make a project really, really successful. And then since I know some of you are probably interested in doing projects or may have actually done projects already on any of these sites, to talk about the things that tend to kind of blow a project up or prevent it from being successful. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to John. Welcome again, and thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Ron. And I uh, also want to say it's, it's an honor to be on the panel, and it's also an honor to uh, be at Full Sail, um, a place where you really can, you really have the opportunity to take your dream and turn it into reality. But there are some things that you need to, to learn and some principles that you need to put into practice, and that's what, we're, that's what we try to be best at here at Full Sail. But um, um, I've been in the investment industry for, I think it's over 13 or 14 years now. Started out as an, as an equity analyst and then went on to, to work for, uh, at that time, the largest financial institution in the world. And uh, it was interesting, uh, just yesterday morning, there was an article from the co-founder of, uh, of um, Indiegogo. And... Uh, saying this, after working on Wall Street, I learned that America is not the land of all possibility, but instead the land of po a possibility for people who know the right people. That's why, that's why I started Indiegogo. And so um, crowdfunding is, a, a, as he said, an extension of the friends and family network. But uh, what you have to do if you want to be successful at anything, really, is you need to put yourself in the shoes of the, of the other person. So if you want to raise money, you want to put yourself in the shoes of the funder, what's important to them. And the more you understand your um, funders, your, the crowd, um, the more successful your uh, project is going to be to raise money for your album or for your video game or for your movie or even TV show, or maybe it's a new invention. Some of the inventions are incredible um, these days. So um, in, in the classroom, when we talk about this, uh, many times um, I'll ask the question, I'll pose the question, what is the most important part of crowdfunding? And uh, invariably, most people uh, would say, well, it's, it's, it's the funding, well, it's the money, you know, show me the money, help me help you, type thing. And so, uh, and the answer is, it's really not. It's the crowd in the crowdfunding. And so the more that you can understand what the, the motivations of the crowd, the better, you, uh, the more money you're going to raise, the more successful you're going to be. So, um, so why do people do this? Why do people give up their hard-earned money to invest in somebody's uh, dream or vision? And by the way, uh, you know, Ron gave some stats. 41% of the CEOs that were surveyed by Inc. Magazine said that they started their business with $10,000 or less. That's pretty encouraging for the people in this room and for the people watching. Uh, that's encouraging because you, if you do it the right way, you can get some results. Um, so um, let me just give you one more picture. Just think about this. You're uh, John Doe or Jane Doe. I'm John Nash. I'm not John Doe. I'm, I like deer. I just don't like deer chili. Okay, but anyway, I'm John Doe. I get up every day. I go to work. And let's say I work for, what do I work for, a cement company? Sure. Okay, I work for a cement company. And I get up and, and I work and I come home. And, but in the back of my mind and inside, I really want to be a movie producer. Okay? So by finding a project where I can fund um, somebody's movie, Ron, that makes me almost, pretty much almost a producer. Pretty close, pretty close. So on my business card, it'll say, you know, cement. I work with cement. And then underneath, almost a producer. 
So it's okay. Everybody's the CEO now as well. So exa exactly. And and if you can go to Hollywood, you'll you, you'll fit right in. So, but anyway, um, so let's talk about the 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 elements uh, the uh, elements that make things successful. First of all, as Ron said, it's an extension of the friends and family. So, friends and family are people that have a connection with you. And if they have a connection with you, then you can, chances are you can raise money from them. Um, but there are other motivations beside that. For, uh, for example, and listen, these are the same things if you're raising money online or offline, right? So if you, if you want to raise a, a money for a building, uh, a lot of people want to put their, their name on a brick. So you see, okay, you see these, these kind of projects. Well, people want to be recognized. Now they're just being recognized online. So it's, it's basically the online version of what uh, previous generations did with bricks and, and uh, putting their names on the projects. Okay, thirdly, um, people want to become part, uh, part of something big. There's something inside of each, each of us that wants to become part of something bigger than ourselves. And this is a way for us to do it and to put our money, whether it's 5 or $10 or it's, or it's $100 or 1000 whatever it is, we can become part of something big. For example, uh, the Pebble Watch. And um, how many have seen the Pebble Watch on Kickstarter? Have you, are you guys familiar with it? So they started with, what did they, what did they want? 100000 And how much did they get? Wow. Over $10 million? Okay, now, are we saying that everybody in this room is going to get $10 million if you put your project on there? No, no, that's not what we're saying. But you see, the principle is that people want to be part of something big. Um, and so then there was the then there's the Delta Maker, which was is actually a local company, and others that have made things like the 3D printer, and so they've raised over a hundred what is it 113,000 uh, or more. And finally, people give to projects that are in alignment with their beliefs. So you may have a belief system, and you're willing to invest into that, and you find somebody that's starting a project. And so these are the motivations of the projects, Ron. And, uh, of course, they've been watching episodes of the Shark Tank, and they want to be the sharks, right, of course. But they don't have, most people don't have millions of dollars. So uh, this is a way to still raise the money for the people that need it, but yet uh, you can literally be across the table and say, uh, for these reasons, I'm out. And, and then find one that you like, and then follow it, and become part of it. And, and uh, it, it's, it becomes part, sometimes it becomes a, a, a major part of your life. So um, in terms of uh, what makes a successful campaign, right? Let's talk about that. Well, this sounds pretty obvious, but first of all, only sell what your market wants. I mean, it sounds really easy, doesn't it? But yet there are projects where, let's say I want to do it, but the market doesn't want to receive it. So you really have to do your homework and find out if the market really wants the project that you want to launch, okay? You got to tell a compelling story because you're trying to sell your dream. And if, you, if you're selling your dream, and make no mistake, you're... We're all salespeople if we're, we have a project. You've got to raise money for it, so you've got to, you've got to sell it. And so you've got to, give a peop, you've got to give people a compelling reason to do it and to do it now. Um, but you've got to tell people that are the right people. And Ron, what I think that means is this is, um, this is what a lot of people miss. Now, did you, you talked about the people that weren't successful. And I think one of the reasons that they are not successful, sometimes people want to put up a project and then they, um, they'll just throw it up there. 
and then start telling people about it. When in reality, they should be treating it like a product launch. And the way to be successful with that is to tell people about it before it's up there, to create excitement and anticipation. And actually, this goes to, this is actually part of, uh, of um, behavioral finance. This is what they study. People get more excited about something before they actually have it. By the time they get it, they're not as excited as they were when they were thinking about it. And so what we're doing is we're tapping into the brain's chemistry by creating anticipation. What I mean by that is we're, we're setting up a product launch where we're telling them a certain number of weeks or months out, hey, this is what we're doing. It's kind of like, have you ever had an event where somebody said, save the date? Okay, but we're doing that on re at regular intervals. This is what we're doing. This is when we're doing it. You want to be a part of it. And uh, so let's just think about that. That old time, okay, so the way they used to do it, if you want to raise money in a, in a ballroom, and like somebody want to have a dinner, let's say it's a nonprofit organization, okay, and they have tables, and there's a speaker that wants to raise a million dollars, okay? They come into that room. Do you think that's the first time that the people in the room have ever heard of that project? And, and do, you, do you think that maybe, just maybe, the person in charge of that project, the fundraiser, the person who's selling their dream... Do you think maybe they've already gone and talked to some of the most successful funders or that, that they perceive to be the most successful funders? And they, have, they set them up into tables. I've been to these. And do you think that the people that are sitting at the table with those uh, pre-informed individuals that know, already know about the project, you think they're going to give more or less money? than the people at the other tables who have never heard of it before. So you see, you see my point? So it's like a product launch strategy. Okay, now let's talk about things that just basically kill a campaign. And there, it's very easy, but knowing about it is one thing, doing it is another. Um, the first thing that kills a campaign is that there's, no, there's just absolutely no passion. Or there's, just, there's no emotion. So to sell something, you have to have emotion. And um, you've got to have a video. I mean, why not take advantage of the opportunity to go viral? Why not create something that uh, is either very creative or funny or gives people a chance to share it? You want them to share it. Don't just put up something simple that's uh, or, or boring. Give them something that they will. They have no choice but to hit that button that that says share with everybody that I know. Okay, so those things will that that'll kill if you don't do that. Your project is is going to be one of those statistics that Ron was talking about. Um, not being available to your funders is another thing that will kill a project. At the end of the day, I know that we're creative people, and we want, like, uh, you know, either we're artists, or we're musicians, or we're, we're script writers, <clears throat> or we um, want to make an album out of a musical, um, which is happening through crowdfunding as well. We're very creative people. I'm a, I'm a keyboard player, so I, I get it. But we have to put on our salespeople cap. And we have to understand the reality that we're selling. And when we do that, we'll be more successful. But if you're not available and you're not around for questions, then um, um, some people will, will, will walk away from that. And, and the last thing I'll say is that you've got to be, um, you have to listen and get feedback from your, from your peeps. Basically, um, and this is something that Guy Kawasaki said in, in one of his books that I read, and he said that the most successful products and companies are not the ones that come out with the perfect product the first time. 
and you know that, Ron, you know that this happens uh, from being an entrepreneur. And so the most successful ones are the ones that listen, they release a product, and then they listen and get feedback, and they change it and modify it and alter it, and they do it again, and they do it again. And how many times do you think they do it, Ron? Constant. It's constant improvement. If you want to get be, to be successful, you have to listen to the, to the people that you're serving. I think those are excellent points. And to dovetail off of something John said, and from hanging out with some of these folks now at Kickstarter and Rocket Hub, just to name the couple of people that I've gotten to know, one of the things they say, which I think is so true, is that sometimes the why is more powerful than the how. So don't tell somebody how you're going to do your project. Tell them why it's important. And if the why about why it's important is because if we can get this message out to people, it'll fundamentally change something. And people start to believe in that and can get behind that. Uh, but I agree with John. If you're not accessible to your, to your customers and you're not responsive to what they're telling you in terms of feedback, that's not a good plan for funding a viable project. One of the things we'd like to change up now and start to talk about, we kind of know where things are a little bit, and we'll be happy to take your questions more specifically about you know, how to do projects uh, in just a few minutes. But I'd like to, to turn it over to Mark because what we want to look at is really where things are headed because this industry, this concept of crowdfunding is changing in a very, very uh, meaningful way. So take it away, Mark. Thank you, Ron. And uh, how many people, incidentally, have been a part of promoting a crowdfunding project on some platform? Wow, that's impressive. So for people watching, uh, almost half, I would say, a third, between a third and a half of people have been involved in some way. That's great. Uh, my hypothesis is that crowdfunding is, as a source of capital for your project or your business is going to get much bigger in the United States quickly. Um, and I've got a pretty big if behind that. Uh, why is it going to get bigger? Because as Ron pointed out earlier, currently it's illegal to sell an investment in your project online. U.S. securities laws don't permit that. But it's kind of intuitive if you think about it that the number of people that are willing to back your project as a donation or reward where they don't have an economic interest in it is if it's successful is probably a lot smaller of a group than the people that would put money behind it if they can get a taste of that benefit in the event that it's, it is successful. And that's just kind of something deep within Americans. If I'm putting up the capital and it works out well, I want to be a part of that. And right now you can't be. So uh, the law is being changed in a way that might permit that. My other hypothesis as to why it's a much bigger source of capital is because we know that from countries where it is legal. Uh, it, it's legal in Australia and has been for a number of years. It's legal in the UK. On average, the size of projects in the UK that are investment-based, where people get an interest in the project, as opposed to simply donation or rewards-based, is more than 10 times the size. So again, my hypothesis is if the laws in the US change in a way that allow people to invest in your project, it's going to be a lot more realistic source of a lot more capital. And the average numbers that you'll get by using crowdfunding as a tool will be much larger. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the law specifically has changed and stands to change. But let me digress for a minute and talk about how the law works right now. Because to me, uh, it's a uniquely non-American concept of American securities laws. Uh, let, let me take you back to a time it's going to be hard for you to imagine. Uh, where basically banks and Wall Street created a massive recession. Uh, at the time, we, we called it the Depression. You know, I don't know what they're going to really call this one 70 years from now, but probably something similar. Uh, so back in the 30s, the government decided, hey, well, Wall Street and the banks just basically killed the entire economy, and that got stuck on the backs of everyday Americans, and we're going to try to protect everyday Americans from Wall Street and the banks. And they created the SEC <sighs> with mixed results. Uh, what they also did is they created a body of laws and they broke, this is the un-American un part, right? They broke Americans into two groups, which are roughly rich people and non-rich people. 
And rich people they call accredited investors and everybody else they call non-accredited investors. And there's different ways that you can be accredited investor, but for simplicity's sake, demographically, it's around the top 2% of the wealthiest Americans. Uh, and for those Americans, in the, un, amazingly, in many respects, these laws haven't changed in 80 years. Uh, for uh, wealthy Americans, they said, yeah, you're on your own. If you want to invest in somebody's private company, go ahead. You're smart enough and sophisticated enough to bear the risk of making that investment. Uh, and for everybody else, the other 98%, the laws that basically say, mm, we're going to look out for you. you know, Companies that want to get money from you or investment banks or underwriters that want in investment money for you are going to have to make a lot of disclosures about what it is because they basically have to teach you to be smart enough to make that investment. And that's true if you're 19 years old and you inherit a million dollars and you don't know a thing in the world, you're deemed to be sophisticated for U.S. securities laws purposes. If you have a Ph.D. in economics and you make 180 grand a year in some college campus, you are deemed to be unsophisticated and not capable of making that investment decision. So this is kind of the system of laws that we inherited. So how's it going to change for crowdfunding? Well, we're kind of we're preserving that. So there's an aspect of both. But uh, lo and behold, in April of last year, uh, the federal government passed the Jobs Act. You may have heard about it. Um, this is another thing that we'll look back and go, wow, this really happened. It happened with amazing bipartisan support. Can you believe that? That probably isn't going to happen again for the rest of our lifetimes. So with amazing bipartisan support and with the support of the president, it was signed into law into April and in April, and it impacts crowdfunding in two ways. For the rich people, for the accredited investors, uh, the way the laws work, even if you're accredited, if you're a company or you're running a project and you want to let people know that they can invest, invest in it and you're going to go to these accredited investors because that's really the only financially feasible way to do it, then um, you can't just willy-nilly contact people. You can't go on the internet under existing law and say, hey, I got this cool idea for a film and I'm going to do this gaming company and you ought to invest in it. You have to have some type of prior existing relationship with that accredited investor. That changed in the JOBS Act. Uh, it changed subject to the SEC writing specific rules. So in the future, and this is gonna happen way earlier than what I call re real crowdfunding, uh, you will likely be able to use the internet or you guys are three screen type people. You know, it could be your TV, you know, it could be any form of communication, it's not limited to the internet. And tell accredited investors about your business opportunity. And again, the law assumes that people that are rich enough can, can fend for themselves and basically determine what they need. Uh, and there's no limit on the amount of capital that you can raise under that exemption. So to Ron's example of 340 million, yeah, you could do that. And if you get enough interest and you actually are able to check and confirm that the people that, investing, that are investing are in fact accredited, and that's where the SEC is writing the rules right now, uh, then you can do that type of offering. The natural way to do that is the internet, right? Because it's going to be the cheapest. I mean, the internet kind of levels the playing field and you can get your word out and your message out and you don't have to pay CBS for advertising to do it. But if you want to do a Super Bowl ad, do that. You know, because that, that, would, that would be possible. The other way and the way that's much more exciting to me uh, is an exemption that we've been working on for some time and that's Title III of the Jobs Act, which says anybody can make an investment in a private company subject to certain limitations. And kind of the, you know, the, the government looked at it and said, well, we're, these, these might be unsophisticated investors, these might be people that have never made an investment before, and therefore we're gonna cap the amount of money that any particular person can put into these companies in the course of a year. And for people making under $100,000 or with less than $100,000 of net worth, it's basically the greater of $2,000 a year or 5% of your annual income. So if you made 100 grand, you could technically invest $5,000 every year across any of these companies, not, not in any one company, but during the whole year. And that's open to all Americans, which is you know, a much more American notion to me. And then the other side of it is, if you're a company and you want to use that for investment, then you can raise up to a million bucks every year under that exemption. And uh, it's capped at a million bucks, so it's not like the other one where you can raise an infinite amount, but still, you know, like, uh, like John was saying, I mean, a million bucks goes a long way in starting a business. So 
the framework that created was created by Congress and signed by the president is actually a pretty well-reasoned, again, bipartisan, well-supported law. But the devil's in the details because both those exemptions are subject to SEC rulemaking. And the SEC is, after all, you know, founded on principles of investor protection. And right now, they're really grappling with the rules under, you know, what they should, what rules they should impose upon companies in terms of disclosure, in terms of independent audits and things like that. And those are all good things for the SEC to be thinking about. Conversely, the SEC has a long history of completely screwing up legal exemptions and putting so much bureaucracy on it that you really, you know, if you need, and what, what excites me more than anything else is kind of crowdfunding equity that's $100,000 or less, that's kind of Main Street, that's real startup businesses. And that capital exists nowhere in America anymore today, by and large, except for angel investors. So that's really what's most exciting to me but you can't go out and raise $100,000 from people if you're gonna spend $40,000 on auditors and lawyers. So that's the balance that the SEC is trying to strike. Uh, they're trying to prevent fraud, but it's important to note that other countries have done this before. In America, we think we invented every wheel. Um, we can look to the British model where there are zero, count them, zero instances of fraud so far uh, with equity crowdfunding. So, uh, that's where we are now. I think equity crowdfunding stands to be a whole new game changer, but the rules have got to come in and they've got to be reasonable. I wonder if you'd mind taking a minute, and this isn't to just plug yourself, but to talk a little bit about Sprigster and what you're doing there. Yeah, so I, I'm a corporate lawyer for 20 years, but uh, I've been a serial social entrepreneur and I love that kind of stuff. I love startups and I've been very active in the crowdfunding movement, both in terms of uh, you know donation rewards based crowdfunding and uh, in the lobbying effort and, and, and part of the effort to get these laws passed to change and update US securities laws. We have a real little site called Sprigster and um, it, it operates under existing law, so that means it's not investment based as of yet. It might be in the future, uh, but it operates only for veterans and military spouses. So we allow military veterans and military spouses to come on and pitch to the crowd to basically get their business started. So that's, that's been a tremendous amount of fun. So kind of a different niche and again, people trying to support veterans that want to start businesses and fund projects is pretty cool. And are there any noteworthy successes that you could point to? Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, part of, part of the issue with crowdfunding right now is just massive uh, dilution of the message because there are so many projects and there are so many platforms. And, uh, you know, we've been very careful on the types of projects that we host um, and we've really limited it so far to franchise-based businesses because in that, in, in that category you have it's just about zero possibility of fraud. There's an independent franchisor, it's FTC regulated, people understand the business. But yeah, we've had some, some very notable successes, including a gentleman in Pensacola that started a mining key dealership, uh, in part using proceeds from our site. So that's, that was somebody who was kicked out of the military. He wanted to stay in, but because of military downsizing, they're eliminating a lot of positions and unemployment amongst veterans is massive. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to do that.